that I could be sharing an inspirational story with you all today. But unfortunately, that's not what I have for you. I'm here to present you all with an issue that's been weighing heavily on my mind and on my heart recently, and I'm hopefully here to present some solutions to this issue. But before I do so, I would like to wish everyone a very happy birthday. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to ask you all a favor, and a favor that I hope will enable us all to celebrate Earth Day a little bit more in our daily lives. But before I do so, I would like to take you all back almost 10 years now, the year 2007. <laughs> now looking back, 2007, <laughs> the last of the Harry Potter installments was released. Uh, Steve Jobs introduced the very first ever iPhone, which is crazy to think about seeing how everyone here has some sort of iPhone or iGadget on them right at this very minute. Oprah Winfrey opened her Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa, which was monumental then and still is today. Um, High School Musical 2 came out. I remember that night very vividly. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, who could forget about Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears and Paris Hilton being ever popular that year? But a lot of people might think about 2007 as something a little bit different. People sometimes remember that year, and 2008 specifically, as something a little bit darker. Something to do with the Great Recession. So in 2008, the U.S. housing market collapsed, and that's what a lot of times people will think of when they think of the years 2007 and 2008, since it was so impact it was such an impactful time in our lives. But there was another global issue that was kind of simmering under the surface, and maybe wasn't popularized as much as the Great Recession was during that time. And that issue is the colony class disorder. Now, can I have a show of hands for everyone who's maybe heard of this term before? Okay, so it's a few people, and that would pretty much be due to the fact that media goes through cycles of popularizing this issue and talking about it and launching campaigns to kind of discuss what it's all about. And right now we're at the height of one of those kind of um, very popular um, times in media for this to be talked about, which is great because I think that's a wonderful way to spread awareness about such a very, very important issue, and that's part of the reason why I'm here today is to talk about it and spread awareness because I think that's one of the best ways to come to solutions. Obviously, sharing ideas is something that um, TED feels passionately with TED Talks are about, so that's something that we're here to do today. So for those of you who may not be familiar with this term, um, colony collapse disorder is, by definition, the disappearance or the death of all of the worker bees or some of the worker bees in a hive. Once these worker bees die off, they leave the queen with just the babies, and obviously a hive doesn't function well without the worker bees. Imagine a school with no students and only teachers. Not, not much would happen there. So um, there are a lot of causes for this, just as there are um, for many other many other issues that we can think about. And they're not all they're not all issues that just have one cause to them. So I'd like to present four of the main causes to you all today. These four causes are global climate change, the Barrow disruptor might which is something that's pretty unique to this, and we'll get we'll get to all of these. Chemical, chemically based pesticides and fertilizers, and our farming practices in the United States. So global climate change relates to this issue because it relates to almost everything that happens in our environment today. Anything you can think of is kind of interconnected with global climate change and everything that's happening. So you can, you can kind of imagine that people would assume that these are a small portion of what's happening with global climate change, but I'd like you to imagine a scenario such as this one. So a bee or a hive of bees is very used to going to the same field of flowers, the same field of crops, every time or every year during the same time in the same month. So imagine that you're a bee and you and your hive are going to the same field that you go to every year during June to pollinate flowers and collect pollen to bring back to your hive. But when you get to that field, all the flowers are gone and they're not there. That is because these flowers have been blooming at different times and you're not sure what to do about that. So you've missed, you've missed your kind of period in the summer to gain your nutrients. So that's that's why global climate change it, sorry, global climate change is such a prevalent issue with colony class disorder. Now the Barroa destructor mite is something that I said is very, very specific to this issue. Um, the Barroa destructor mite is actually a mite that preys on the bees and will enter into the hives. The Barroa destructor mites have these piercing tongues that they can use to enter into the bees' bodies and will actually suck out their blood. And although that sounds kind of gruesome, it's not the main point that I'm trying to make here. What normally happens with these Moroa destructor mites is that once they pierce the bees' exoskeleton and suck out their blood, they often leave behind diseases and viruses 
So this is kind of analogous to humans using dirty needles to inject drugs that leave behind viruses and diseases that you don't, you don't necessarily want and can eventually be fatal. Pesticides and fertilizers are obviously not healthy for bees for a multitude of reasons. Pesticides, by definition, are meant to kill bugs and bees and all animals of that nature. So of course they're not going to be especially healthy for bees. But there is one type of pesticide in particular that is extremely toxic to bees, and those are called neonicotinoids. Now, neonicotinoids can mess with the bees' development. It can affect their nervous system and the way that they perceive information and the way they remember to do things. Most importantly, it can affect their immune system. So these pesticides and the varroa, the varroa destructor mites can kind of work hand in hand. Once these pesticides um, succeed in weakening the bees' immune systems, the varroa destructor mites have a much easier time preying on the bees, sucking their blood, and eventually leaving with them leaving them with diseases that can kill them. Now, we're all in Ohio, so you know what it's like to be surrounded by fields and fields of corn and soy <laughs> all the time. Anytime you take a road trip, you go through fields and fields of corn. And so imagine what it's like to be a bee and live in a hive kind of off of a cornfield and not have access to many flowering crops. By the way, corn and soy are self-pollinating, so they don't need outside pollinators to pollinate them the way that flowers do with bees. So I, what I'd like you all to do now is imagine yourself as a bee. I know it's a little bit silly, I'm just trying to do it, bear with me, it'll, it'll help you. So imagine that you're a bee, and you've just come out of a very hard winter, it's been a long winter, it's really cold. Um, it's pretty typical for about 10 to 15% of bees to die off in a hive because of the cold temperatures during the winter. But with colony collapse disorder, we're actually seeing about 30 to 35% of the hive dying off during the winter. So that's a huge spike and that's obviously something to be worried about. Now keep imagining yourself as a bee. You just came out of this very harsh winter and now you're looking for flowers and you're looking for ways to really um, to gain pollen to bring it back to the hive and to provide for your other bees. But you can't find any flowers because you're surrounded by fields of only one crop and those crops are self-pollinating. Once you do find flowers or crops that you can pollinate, those crops are soaked in pesticides and fertilizers that are very toxic to you and they make you sick and they make you weak and they make it very hard for you to do your job. So you go back to your hive with all the other bees who are also sick and who are also weak. And there are mites in your hives now and they're preying on you and they're sucking your blood and they're leaving you with diseases that eventually kill you and the rest of your hive and leave only the queen. So, I don't know about you guys, but this is something that's, that's really scary for me to think about. And I know that if this was, if this was something that was happening to dogs or cats, it's something that would be, it would be a national outrage. People would want to do something about it immediately. But because it's bees, because they're insects, people don't normally see this as such, as such a prevalent issue in society. But it really, it truly is, I'm telling you. The bees can do so much for us, and it's, this is such an issue that's been really overlooked in the past. And so if you feel passionately about animal rights the way that I do, I would hope that you would feel passionately to try to help and resolve some of this issue. But if that's not enough for you, think of yourself. One of my favorite statistics to throw out there is that bees pollinate one in every three mouthfuls of food that we consume as humans. So a great way to think about this is think about one of those toddler trays or toddler, um, toddler plates that are divided into three. And imagine you filled up that plate with your food for the day, and then you take one of those thirds away. That's how much food you're left with. Now, I'm not saying that all of the food in the world would suddenly disappear, because that's certainly not what's happening. But we would be left with mostly crops that are self-pollinating, such as corn and soy. So we'd be missing those fruits and vegetables, we would be missing those leafy greens, and the things that everyone really looks forward to eating. A great example of this is obviously the almond industry. The almond industry is a booming industry in California specifically. These actually have to be flown into California to pollinate the almond groves. And we're running out of bees to do this. Honestly, the almond industry has been um, significantly reduced in the past few years because of the fact that we don't have enough bees to, to do this anymore. And so if we continue on this trend, then we really will, we really, sorry, we really will start to see a significant loss in the produce that we really know and love that we depend on today. So of course there are big picture solutions to this issue, just like there are with every, with every issue there are big picture solutions. We can petition our government, we can ask people to be aware of the situation, we can ask people to do what they can to solve the issue. Something that is a big picture solution but is also very effective for this issue is to, is to um, 
make rewards for farmers to do what they're not doing today. So we can ask farmers to leave some of their fields as habitat for, habitats for pollinators, and not just bees, for bats and butterflies and other pollinators who will help their crops. We can ask them to plant crops that are actually flowering instead of just one cash crop so that we don't have what people are considering to be food deserts, just deserts and deserts and fields and fields of corn and fields and fields of soy. We can ask them to add more variety to what they're planting, to rotate the crops to make sure that the soil is healthy and that they can plant more crops that will help the pollinators. But my favorite thing, it's strange to say that you have a favorite thing about an issue, but my favorite thing about this issue, and something that keeps me very optimistic about the future of this issue, is that there are so many solutions to this issue that are so tangible and so doable for everyone in this room. Uh, for everyone in this room to actually execute and to do and implement into their daily lives. So, of course, we can all cut down on our use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers. I know that in our yard, we use them in our, in our garden, we use them in our grass, and it's really hard to kind of give up having green grass and having a nice garden, but there's so many other ways that you can fertilize your gardens without using chemically-based fertilizers or chemically-based pesticides, which will, of course, make sure that the bees are much healthier. Next, we can let weeds live in our yard. And I know this is kind of crazy to say, because a lot of times people don't want to see dead lines. They don't want to see clover, and they don't want to see alfalfa growing in their green grass. But actually, these are very key elements to helping bees survive. They need a lot of the nutrients from weeds, such as dandelions, and so leaving those in your yards is actually very beneficial to bees. Next, you can buy local. And buying local does a lot more, does a lot more than just supporting your local economy. And it does a lot more than just um, supporting your farmers and supporting your beekeepers. It does all of that, but it makes sure that where you live, there are farms that are planting and they are growing and that they are leaving habitat for bees. So buying local is something that's very important here, and I know that we all have access to farmers markets in the area that we live in. There's a great one in Perrysburg, there's a great one in downtown Florida, so you do have access to kind of buying local and everything like that. But by far, my favorite solution to this issue is planting flowers. And that is because it's so simple, it's so easy, it's inexpensive, and it's absolutely beautiful. So planting flowers in your front yard, in your backyard, anywhere you can, is such an easy solution, but it's something that we can all do. If you live in an apartment, you can plant flowers in a window box, or you can plant them on a pot on your front, on your, on your front step. So it's something that everyone in this room, I know everyone in this room planted has flowers, it would look a lot more beautiful outside, and a lot more bees would have a source of nutrients during all times of the year. So I hope that this is something you can all think about and, and that you can all kind of help to reverse this situation. So thank you all for listening to me and I hope that you leave this um, having a heightened, a heightened passion for bees is something that you can do.